Before this video begins, I would like to take a quick moment to thank Bane Books for helping set up the interview uh, that is in this video, and I would also like to apologize for the audio quality. When I was working in editing this video, I ran into some problems, and I was not able to get the best audio quality. So you can still hear the interview, but it's just, you might have to turn up your volume a lot. I apologize for that. This was in no way the fault of the author or the publisher that helped set this up. This was my problem in editing, but I still hope that you enjoy the video. Hello, and welcome to my channel. My name is Jonathan Cohn, and I am delighted to be able to have Tony Weisskopf, the publisher of Bain Books. Tony, thank, thank you so much for being on the channel. Oh, well, thanks for, for having me. I, I appreciate it, yeah. Um, I have to first off say I really appreciate how well Bain works with uh, reviewers and works with us to be able to do things like interviewing with your authors and your editors, and also making sure that uh, we're communicating if there's new releases, that news are coming. So I wanted to thank you so much for working with us. Oh, well, it, it is our pleasure. We, 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 we try to make that um, interaction uh, with reviewers and with fans part of Bain's culture. Yeah. So you have been at Bain for quite a long time. Uh, <laughs> yes. When I looked it up online, it said it was 86 or 84. Uh, was it about 84 was when, when Bain shipped its first books, mm -hmm. and um, 87 was when I came on. 87. Oh. So yeah. you've been with him. Almost since the beginning. Almost since the time. beginning, yeah. yeah. Um, how has the publishing industry changed since that beginning, and how has your role changed <laughs> over time as well? Wow. Well, I mean, I started out as the lowest of the low. I was a, a, an editorial assistant, so mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was, you know, filing and xeroxing and 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 uh, just thrilled to work at a publisher that had computers for their editors yeah. and not just for the accounting department. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we were, we were, Bain was cutting edge in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so I, I, through, through my 30 plus years here uh, at Bain, um, I've, I've, I've worked my way up. Um, I've, I've worked in the production department. Um, I, I've worked as an assistant editor, worked as an editor, and then when Jim Bain passed, um, I became a publisher, editor in chief, and also art director. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's you know that's the part that doesn't usually go with publisher or editor in chief. But um, but Jim always did it, and uh, he had such a great eye um, for a cover and, and and such a such a such great working relationships with his artists that it, it, it was easy easy to step into uh, those shoes. Now I have to say, as an art director. I rely heavily on our designers. We mm -hmm. have two designers who've been with Bain for a very long time. Carol Russo. Yeah. Um, yes. And Jenny Ferries is, yes. is, is the other. She's the new person who's only been here for like 25 years or something like yeah. that. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the two of them um, are just amazing. Um, and, and, and Carol especially has really shaped what consumers think of as the look of science fiction, fantasy, mm -hmm. and horror, just because she's done so much work, not just for Bane, but also for Tor and Ace before that, and um, and just throughout the industry. She's an amazing, amazing uh, woman, and, uh, and also an amazing designer. So. so you bring up the cover design stuff, which is yeah. actually my next question. So oh, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> with, the, with that, you know, you said she's helped shape how people view covers, yeah. and that's very true because uh, so many people, when they go to the bookstore, they can tell a book is not just science fiction, but a Bane book yeah. because there's this quality to them. And so many publishers now, uh, including the science fiction fantasy ones, are going to this more modern, more bland, minimalistic type of covers. Yeah. And Bane has absolutely not done that. <laughs> Was that a cognizant choice? And uh, if so, can you talk a little about why, a little bit about why? It it it, it is, um, and of course the, the other people that I rely on as an art director are the artists. Mm -hmm. um, um, we we have a great stable of artists um, that we've worked with some since the very beginning um, of Bain. Tom Kidd being one, David Mattingly being yeah. another, um, who've been with us for the whole ride. Um, and I I think um, that the interaction between the cover illustrator and the author and the reader is an important one. 
um, I, I, I think it, it, it's of course a sell piece too, right? Yeah. It, it, it's your it's your first point of marketing, whether it's online or in a bookstore. You know, you know, it's going straight from eyes to back of brain, right? And, and you're getting that ideally emotional um, response mm -hmm. to to a piece of artwork that you know will then you know move your hand forward yeah. and get your wallet out, right? <laughs> so, um, but but I think for science fiction. Science fiction is, and, and fantasy too, I'd say science fiction and I mean the bigger umbrella, yeah. right? Um, that uh, it's, it is a fiction of ideas. Mm -hmm. And to be able to visualize that is helpful, yeah. right? It, it's, it's an entry point into the world, into the story, into the characters. Um, and the artists brings a lot to the table. Um, so I so I think it's important to have illustrative covers um, for science fiction and fantasy. That's one of the things that you know an axiom that people say is don't judge a book by its cover. But marketing departments hate that fallacy because <laughs> that's the entire point of it. And in many ways, it helps pick. Like there, I'll be honest. There are times where I've specifically picked up a Bain book. This was before I really knew what Bain books was. Sure. But I picked up the book because of the cover, not because I knew the author or the, the I, I cared for the description. So I can say it's it's working. So. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and and of course we do try to brand, right? Yeah. Um, we we don't um, we don't prescribe to our our, our artists. Yeah. Um, we uh, we we ask the artists to respond to the works, um, but. But, but there is a, a sense with these very diverse artists from, from Tom Kidd, who's very painterly, and Bob Eggleton, um, to uh, Sam Kennedy and uh, Kurt Miller and Dave Seeley, who can be um, more slick and, and, and hard-edged, um, that, uh, that, that there's that sense of adventure that you get from the artwork. Um, so even though they don't all look the same, we are trying to get the same evoked feeling, and that is absolutely 100% on purpose. So. And I, I think that's worked. So well, good. The last good. thing that's, on that's covers great to hear. Thank I you. want to talk about <laughs> is the new Tim Akers book. We're, oh, we're here yeah. at Dragon Con, for people yeah. who, who, who didn't know, we're here at Dragon Con where they have something called the Dragon Awards, mm -hmm. which are very prestigious, at least I think they're prestigious, yeah. um, uh, uh, awards that are given out, and they're usually voted on by fans. They're always voted and, on by fans. Yes. And so yeah. um, this year, there were several Bane titles that were nominated in a few uh, areas, but one of which was the, the Tim Akers book, Wraithbound, which had a, uh, do you know who did the cover art on this one? Yes, Jeff Brown. Jeff Brown. Yeah. This one got uh, cover art. Can you tell us why this cover you think works so well in your as an editor and, and art designer? Well, I, I I think it's got uh, all all of that sense of story, you know, that mm -hmm. the the that um, that invites you into it. And um, as an art director, I chose that pose, right? That you know, mm -hmm. the, the the artist gave me several options from uh, from which to choose, and and uh, and that was the pose I wanted because that allows the viewer to put themselves in the place of the hero, mm -hmm. right? And 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 then you know, you're facing this truly scary monster <laughs> um, and uh, it just made for an amazing cover um, we do a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation at mm -hmm. uh, conventions including Dragon Con um, where we show off our art um, and that always got just a woo response yeah. when, when, when we show it to, to, to audiences um, so I think the colors work um, and, and, and again it's, there's that sense of story right you can yeah. see oh wow this is this is going to be something that I want to read about yeah and it's and you have uh, a sword in one hand and almost like a, like a gun looking type thing in the other hand yeah. and that automatically makes you think what time period is that so it right. makes you ask questions <laughs> right. a cover that makes you ask questions right so. exactly and, and that's you know and, and when I do writers workshops that's exactly what I tell my writers they need to do is they need to raise that question in the reader's mind alright there's a gun and a sword how did you know? How is the author justifying this, right? Um, and of course, swords are just always cool. So, <laughs> so moving off of um, cover design, although we okay, could spend, well, we, could yeah, spend, we, we could spend forever. We truly could. About we, we could. We could. We're very proud of our covers. Yes, so. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm very pleased with them. There was in the writing community. There's a ton of authors who want to get published, and most, yeah. if not all, publishing houses have a Dutch lush file, yep. which is where. People will send their manuscripts, and so few of them work out. They tried this in television a couple of times, and it, it, it doesn't happen as much in television. Oh. But it happens a lot with um, with, yeah. with writers. Yeah. How 
how do you guys have to handle a slush pile? Because I would think it would be daunting, wouldn't it? It, but it does, and it, it, it also eats away at your soul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you feel so bad that you have to say no to all of them. You absolutely do. Um, we have had for uh, many years a, a slush master general, um, a man named Gray Reinhardt. Um, he, he works as a freelancer for us, um, and he has the fortitude. He's truly a paladin of editing. Um, he has the fortitude to be able to... Um, um, compassionately uh, work with authors, as you say, 99% of whom you're going to say no to. Um, and he's just, uh, he's just absolutely amazing. Um, we also use volunteer readers. We also use volunteer readers. Um, so uh, if you're a voracious reader and you like the kind of stuff that Bain does, we, Gray will invite you to, <laughs> to, uh, to, to help us out. Um, Do you ever get really just what, like, wacky stuff, or is it general, generally keeping the same type of stuff that Bain normally does? Oh, no. I mean, we, I, I would say that we get a fairly high level in, in, our, in our slush pile. And of course, I haven't read the raw slush for many, many years. Right, now. yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but you have a team for that now. We do, we do. Um, but it's... Uh, um, uh, I, I would say maybe 50 to, to 75% are things that are just on, on their face, obviously not what we do, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then there's the 20 you know, to 25% of stuff that, okay, it's science fiction, it's fantasy, it's written in English. Okay, you know, we'll read a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you can tell very quickly whether it's going to be, I really need to read this which is a great place to be, right? If you're yeah. in the slush and your, your, your manuscript is, oh, they, they needed to read it. <laughs> you know? And then at that point, it's much more um, refined decision. Is this a Bain book, right? Yeah. Not just is it a good book, but is it is it something that Bain readers are going to respond to? And I, I appreciate that because you have that brand that works so well that you're yeah. talking about because some publishers get so big or have so many arms that sure. I couldn't really describe their um, brand if I wanted to because it's so I mean Bain has a wide variety but I can still brand it together and so do you guys talk with authors about saying you know this author your book's really good you need to tweak it to fit the brand more or do you try to tweak the brand to fit the new author well I I think the Bain brand again is about evoking a feeling um, in a reader Mm -hmm. so you can do that across multiple Genre, I mean, science fiction and fantasy, to be sure, but a little techno thrillers. But um, so, so it wouldn't be a matter necessarily. You either get that feeling or you don't. Um, so, so for an individual work, um, there wouldn't be a, a tweaking. We might say we really like your work. We don't think this is suitable for us. Please end to something else. Mm-hmm. Um, that that would be as far as that goes. Okay. Uh, Specifically, I do want to talk about one series that you have, which okay. I love, which is Timothy Zahn's new uh, Icarus series. Aren't they series. fun? They are so, they are so fun. much fun, yes. Uh, they're really the, the kind of that puzzle box storytelling that yeah. people like J.J. Abrams try to do, yeah. um, but I think they're, it's really effective here. We had the hardcover, which came out um, last year, and yes. the mass market, which, uh, is it already out, or is it coming out soon? Oh, yeah. That's, that's hard to keep up with all of Go those. to the website. Yes, go to the website. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is it that you think that connects readers uh, with his Icarus series? Well, of course, as you know, we, we've been publishing uh, we've, we've been publishing Tim's on for a very long time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's certainly before I got there. Yeah. Um, uh, Tim uh, Tim had been publishing stories, hard science fiction stories, in analog, um, and when his editor from analog came to Bain, Tim also naturally um, submitted, and we started uh, publishing his Cobra uh, yeah. Cobra series. Um, at Bain, and uh, uh, so, so we like his stuff, yeah. right? Um, the stuff that he'd been doing for us earlier had been more straight military science fiction. Mm-hmm. So themes about um, uh, returning veterans and um, and and how you integrate. Um, uh, warriors back into a civil society after a war, what happens when that war heats up again. Um, and these are not military science fiction, right? No, they're not. They, <laughs> they, they, they're heist, they're yes, heist fiction, heist, heist fiction. Which, is, and, and, which is so much fun. Okay, so, so the themes are a little lighter. 
um, and the char- but the characters are just as much fun. Um, the, uh, the technology and how the characters respond to technology and the alien races are just as much fun. Um, and I, I, I think at this, at this point in time, we're, we're ready for things that are maybe a little lighter. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that does resonate with people. And I think it does because you, you, you start in this book really feeling for the characters and the, 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 the need for them to solve the mystery, and you start being worried that if they don't solve the mystery, something will happen to them. Yes, and yes. I, I, that, that put me on edge in a good way yeah. as, as a reader. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciated yeah. that. Um, if, if you can think back through all the books you've done back through 87 <laughs> that yeah. you had the opportunity to read, so you won't have to, uh, not affecting anything that's upcoming, was there a book that when you read it that just shocked you? That you that, that you were like you when whether you were an assistant <laughs> and you said, Hey guys, this one's worth it or when, as an editor and a publisher, was there ever a book that just man, you were you were surprised by it? Well, I, when I came on board I was so cynical. I was right you know, it was like nothing new is being you know, is is, is any good, you have to go back and read the old classics, <laughs> everything is horrible, blah 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 blah. And Jim was like you're wrong, and I will, I will show you you're wrong. Um, and 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 the two uh, the two series that he got me started on were Lois McMaster Bujold, um, mm-hmm. and the Forkosigan yep. Saga, um, which was just starting at that time, and is and was fantastic. Yes. Um, and Elizabeth Moon, the Dita Paxonarian. Um, yes. Yes. I, I, yeah. In in fact, I I, I I made a mistake. I I brought um, I read the first book. She Farmer's Daughter loved it. Read Divided Allegiance over the weekend. Saturday night, I'm like, I need the office to be open now. <laughs> and it wasn't open on Sunday, let me tell you. So I had to suffer until I could, I, I could go and get Oath of Gold. So um, never made that mistake again. You always get them all at the same time. <laughs> but, um, those books really made me appreciate, okay, with the right editor and the right publisher behind an author, you can get good new stuff. Um, and uh, it, it, it's really um, made me optimistic um, that there was good stuff out there to be found. And, of course, um, you know, then Eric Flint came along with Mother of Demons and David Weber and, and uh, you know, more recently Larry Correa and Chuck yeah. Gannon. And, you know, and, and of course, the, you know, people like Tim Zahn just keep on doing good stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. So uh, my next question is about your role as kind of the overall publisher. You touched on, you're an editor, you're a, the publisher, you're working in the art department, yeah. which is a lot of work. <laughs> and um, I was talking with some of the other people that work at Bain, and they said you typically have about seven-ish titles per month, whether it's re, 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 um, reprints, reprints sure. or original new titles. That's kind of a balance. Yeah. So are you hands-on with all of them, or are you hands-on with some, or do you, are you kind of more broad? Like, what's, what's your role at, since you're the publisher? Yeah, I, I can't be I can't be hands on with every single book, mm-hmm. um, um, and I have an amazing staff, mm-hmm. so I don't have to be. Um, we um, uh, generally at, at, at publishers you'll be assigned one editor, right? Yeah. And and that editor is your advocate. But if that editor leaves, that's it, right? Yeah. Um, at Bain we practice gang editing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we all love science fiction and fantasy. We all love what we're doing, um, and so any any one of us could be reading your book um, and, uh, and, 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 and responding to it and giving you input um, at any given time. Um, so I do try to read as many as I can, mm-hmm. um, and I certainly try to, <coughs> um, when we're starting, you know, when an author is starting out with us or the first of a new series, I, I, I will try to work directly um, with an author for those. Um, but, uh, but as I say, I, you know, I can rely on my staff to, to, to work with authors you know, just as well, if not better. <laughs> <laughs> and you have you have the staff who are just the editors and the the assistants and everyone that works at Bain Books, full time. Yes. And then you have people like Eric Flint, David Weber, <laughs> these people, Larry Correa, these people who write and uh, edit short story collections for yes. you guys. How does that work? In that they're they're the ones with the name edited by on there. Are you guys involved in the editing process, or is it more they they finish it and you guys just put the finishing touches on it. That's a really good question. Um, uh, and, and not many people ask it, so well, yeah, kudos to you. Um, it, it, in the case of a shared world, 
Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for instance, Larry Correa, Monster Hunter uh, Files. Right. Um, or David Weber, uh, the Honorverse um, mm -hmm. anthologies. Um, the authors have a vested interest in making sure that those stories and the authors who are selected to write stories and play in their universe will play nicely um, and, will, uh, and will work to canon. Um, so they are absolutely hands-on um, uh, on the editorial side. If you see a co-editor, the co-editor is also going to be hands-on, um, but they may be more involved in the, um, um, in the trafficking and you know, making sure piddly details like contracts and payments and things like that get, get, oh. get, get done. Because, of course, we all do it for the fun. But it is a business, it right? Is business. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so the the Bain staff is involved with it only in as much as we are with uh, with a novel. When um, when the manuscript is submitted, we'll read it. We'll provide input. Um, although we will we will often if the if the editor asks, we will have uh, suggestions for in, for invitations. Now, the, a suggestion is not a guarantee. Yeah. Um, usually, the way that uh, shared world will work is that um, uh, we'll ask the uh, the author to submit an idea, and if it makes sense again to the creator of the world, mm -hmm. then they'll get the thumbs up. But if it doesn't, then, then no. Um, Larry Niven and his Magazine Wars yeah. is really the model that we follow, follow with that. Okay. And Larry has just been ruthless about rejecting people, very big name people, <laughs> mm -hmm. who Jim would have killed to have on the covers. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right. Uh, but but because they didn't work for the Magazine Wars. Um, and uh, or their story uh, didn't didn't turn out to work for the man because inwards and Larry's conception of that and we try to stay true to that um, we, we we try to we, we try to be the world's advocate um, as well um, so that's for a shared world for a themed anthology generally an editor will come to us um, again with the with with a theme with a concept with a list of uh, potential invitees and again if we have uh, you know if we have somebody that we think will be appropriate um, we'll suggest but it ultimately goes down the editor whose name is on the cover okay. yeah so the next question is about a little bit more about the business side of it you guys work with Simon and Schuster we do and so how does that dynamic work in terms of do you regularly meet with their editors, their team? Do you have business meetings with them? Is it more of a casual relationship, or do you are you guys intricately involved with how Simon & Schuster works? Well, our, our relationship with Simon & Schuster goes back to the very beginning. Um, we are an independent company. We are not owned by Simon & Schuster, um, but Simon & Schuster is our distributor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for uh, for the life of, of Bain, they have... Um, uh, been our sales force um, and uh, and our warehouse um, and so so we do work very closely with them but not on a, on the editorial side yeah. only with the only with the um, the sales and distribution side um, so we're, we are separate from Simon and Schuster's editorial um, and now although it wasn't true then now um, corporately. The distribution side right. is separate from <laughs> from from, uh, from the editorial side. So um, Simon Schuster has just been sold to a holding company, KKR. Yeah. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what develops over the next few years uh, from that side. Uh, but that said, yes, we do. We we meet with the sales force um, every season. Um, we um, we I, I have a monthly meeting with them, and, and we do work closely with them to to try to get our books out there into the world. Um. And then when you are working on a book, are there certain tropes or are there certain things that you think work really well that, uh, not just part of the Bane brand, but you just mm -hmm. as a reader really gravitate towards? <laughs> or are there some tropes that you would consider cliches that they're not the things that you prefer to see when, you, when you're reading? Ooh. All right, so tropes is a new thing, right? They didn't have tropes when I was growing up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There was no website. It was like, ah, oh, you know, this is a pattern. We right. see a pattern. Right? <laughs> um, so I, I try, so the answer is I try not to, okay? okay. Um, there, there may be things that push my buttons unconsciously that I'm not aware of, um, but, uh, but, but, but I, you know, I really think it's up to the skill of the author. I mean, you know, Shakespeare stole all of his plots, right? 
that was fine. <laughs> you know, he did a good job. It was okay, right? Wow. You know, that these, you know, that Romeo and Juliet was a trope, right? Yeah. You know, it was, you know, pyram- and he made fun of it himself then you know, with pyram- the Pyramus and Thisbe in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, it's what you do with the trope that, you know, as, as an author. Um, so yeah, I mean, that said, you know, we don't publish um, things that are relentlessly nihilistic. We mm-hmm. don't, um, uh, you know, we, we, don't, um, uh, we don't publish horror. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'm, it's, it's not that I don't like horror as a genre. I think horror as a genre is fine. It's just that me as a person, I don't need to be reading it. <laughs> and <laughs> so. also, I think that you have limited space. Yes, on absolutely. You do. Yes. When you, if, if you ever grow, you can think about that. But yes. when, you're, when you're limited... So yeah. How many books you can do? You want to publish the stuff you want to publish. We do, and you know, it's a matter of headspace, right? Um, you know, when you're when you're publishing science fiction and fantasy, you are of necessity going to read crappy science fiction and fantasy to protect the readers from this. Um, I don't need to be reading crappy horror. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Bane is a boutique, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we are able to be branded because we aren't trying to be all things to all people. Yeah. So. Uh, you guys do some conventions. You have yeah. things like Liberty Con, yeah. which is held in Tennessee, that I was kicking myself that I didn't make it to this year. I thought, oh, well, there'll be tickets <laughs> available later. And then I checked later, and they sold out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you go to conventions like Dragon Con. Yes. What is that dynamic for both you as the editor and publisher, and then also for your authors, that the, the need for going out and doing these conventions and why you think they're so important? Well, it's ninety uh, percent is um, being able to be where our our authors are. Um, again, back when I started in the business in the eighties, when a writer finished a book, he would pack it up in his you know shoebox and he would bring it to New York and come to the New York offices. Um, and the artists they all lived in the New York area and they would bring their you know their paintings into the office. And the office was like an art gallery because it would be all these beautiful, original, yeah. oil <laughs> paintings, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and the dynamic has changed, right? Mm-hmm. Authors and artists aren't tied to New York City anymore because, yeah. you know, computers changed everything. Um, so if we want to find authors, we need to go where they are. Um, and they go to conventions that they like and treat them well. And Dragon Con has a very strong literary track, very strong writer's track. Um, and so coming to conventions is a way to make contact with our authors who travel and who enjoy this and who get the energy from it, um, but also to find new authors. Um, and to uh, I spoke to Jody Lynn Nye's Writer's Workshop here, yeah. um, and, uh, and I'll be speaking on the writer's track um, in a, on a few panels as well. And to be able to make known the Bain brand to people who are up and coming. Um, um, when it comes to, you were talking about the paintings, um, yeah. Do they still ever do full paintings? I know that, for, oh, for yeah. example, um, uh, with the, the the Way of Kings over at Tor, they, yeah. they like Brandon had to pay a lot of money to get it. Do your authors ever buy their their big oil paintings and put them up? So, so, or sometimes. Do you guys ever buy them? Oh no, we don't. <laughs> we can't afford them. <laughs> uh, but yes, some of our authors do. Um, uh, Mark Van Name is an art collector, and he has, I believe, all of his covers. Um, point, point of pride to do that, but but some of them do. Um, and uh, every, every now and then, a, a, an artist will gift us a painting. So um, so we do have a few originals in the Bain office, which is yeah, which is which is a great treat. Um, you know, and but we do prints. We you know we do we do prints for the office and. Um, um, and it's great to have that. It's like it's like, it's like working in an art gallery to, um, to do that. Um, but yeah, people absolutely still work. Um, you know, in, in, in Bob Eggleton does. Tom Kidd does. Um, Dave Seeley does too. Yeah. Um, he can he can double in brass, right? He he does both um, computer um, and uh, um, you know. Full paint. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to these shared universes from Weber and Korea and others, do do you rely on them? to be continuity masters, or do you guys have any say in making sure that the continuity stays? Like, as an editor, if you don't know this character died previously, 
how does that how does that work for you guys? Well, we, we there's one particular author, John Ringo, who, <laughs> who we who, who we we have uh, we have specialists who work who work in their series, and for Ringo in particular, we look for what we call the Walking Dead, right? Mm-hmm. So so characters who have have died who who magically, <laughs> although not on the page, <laughs> right, the right, reappear, right? <laughs> Um, so uh, yeah, um, yeah. Usually, it's the copy editors who will keep a series bible, um, and sometimes those bibles become Massive. tomes. <laughs> so for the Leaden series, um, the fans keep a wiki yeah. um, that uh, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller rely on, and and the authors will ask the fans, <laughs> "Hey, we know that we had the you know the hair color of this character." Can somebody please tell us where we had there? <laughs> and they will, right? They'll they'll be able to find it. Well, that's yeah. that's cool in a sense that that you guys are thinking about this continuity, but also the fact that they would go and use their audience. For that. Oh yeah. You, that that you don't feel that that kind of a thing would be looked down upon. That that you guys value your audience that much that you'd go to them to ask a question like that. Absolutely, absolutely. It, 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 and again, it's it's the interaction. Right, that that's that's the essence of fiction. Right, it's the interaction between what what the author had and what you get from those words. Um, and that's and again, science fiction and fantasy, literature of ideas. That interaction and that collaboration is part of our genre. It's part of how it works and why it works. So I have uh, one final question on. On something you do uh, that's more into uh, the in-house, like how, how you guys write your things. So if you say no, we can't do this. I'll cut <laughs> okay, it off. okay, okay. Uh, but if you say yes, we can do. So it has to do with the author book spy page at the beginning of the book. Yes. For for I believe all the ones I've been able to keep track of, you guys do um, uh, just the titles of the author from Bane. Correct. But on the back flap of the book, you will include if they've written for other book series and they've written for other universes like Timothy Zahn and he's written Star Wars books you right. include that in that sure what goes into the decision making behind that and uh, why have you guys I mean I'm not saying it's necessary wrong but why have you guys chosen just to use the vein books on that I, now if, if an author requests um, we, we will include their, their full list of titles um, if it's reasonable. But at this point, nobody can do David Weber's full list of titles <laughs> because it's, it's, it's more than one page now. It is, yes. <laughs> so all the Bane books are more than one page. Right, yeah. I'm pretty sure the Honor Harrington series yeah. are just more than one page. Point, so that yeah. becomes crazy. Um, but, uh, but, but authors have asked us to, to, include, um, uh, to include other titles, and we will. Um, you know, but it's an advertising page, right? right? Yeah, it's it's it a is. piece of advertising. So if I don't have to advertise my competitors. I'm not, not I'm, not, I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> but but certainly, if, you know, if we're talking about the biography on the back, then I think it's a useful piece of information for the reader to have, right? To say, oh, I have encountered this author before. They've written in this other universe. Uh, maybe I will perhaps be interested in this as well. So then I'm using it to sell my book, and that's fine. Right? <laughs> right? That, so yeah, it's a it's a purely business decision. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think that it does, it's not quite as important as it may have been 30 years ago because uh, we have the internet. Right. The, there's websites like Fantastic Fiction that are so good at linking if they wrote books in a series for this publisher, but then the next books, um, like like, like, like uh, Christopher Rocchio, yes, uh, yes. He's, he just recently moved over to you guys, but that yes. was a cool get. You, yeah. guys, you guys made a lot of good news. <laughs> you made a lot of people happy, yeah. but uh, you can look online to see for that type of thing, whereas before you would have had to rely on on the, the, the books by page. Yes, yes. And, and of course, you just want to make it easy, right? You want to make it easy for, you, you know, so you don't have to go someplace else to find this information. You know, you don't have to go look at Wikipedia. It's just, you know, the information that you need to make your decision is right there. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been so delightful, and I've learned so much about how you guys operate at Bain Books. Oh, well, thank, and thank you for helping orchestrate and work with uh, book reviewers like myself who are really interested in uh, connecting more with authors. Well, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much. So you can find Bain Books uh, wherever books are sold. You can find uh, their website. What's their, What's your website? It's, it's a hard one. It's Bain.com. <laughs> so, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> solid bread. Yeah. Bain.com. And until next time, I'm Jonathan. And thank you for watching.